Welcome everyone. We are going to give our attendees a few moments to join and then we'll get started. We have uh, some amazing panelists here with us today. And Justin will be moderating uh, our presenting Income Lab to Clients webinar and we'll get started here in just a moment. All right, thank you all for joining. This is the webinar with, uh, we have three panelists, Beth Anilo, Riley Anderson, Cody Crawford, Just, and Justin Fitzpatrick. We will be having a discussion on presenting Income Lab to your clients. Uh, before we get started, just a few things. We have another webinar coming up May 2nd with our newest feature being launched. And then we also have our Lab Talk Tuesday next month. So those two webinars, please feel free to register for those. Last but not least, at the end of this webinar, we have a survey, and that survey provides us with valuable information on what you would like to hear in our next webinars, also some next steps maybe based on the webinar that you heard today, so please take the time to fill that out. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to Justin, and we'll get started. Thank you, Taylor, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us, and especially thank you to our panelists today, Beth, Riley, and Cody. Um, these are often our, our most requested, uh, most reviewed, most valuable uh, webinars is hearing from advisors, um, things about how, how they use the software, about their practice, about the impact on clients. So I, these are really, they've become my, my favorite thing to do. And I really appreciate it. I know it's a, uh, a, a lot to, uh, to give up some time and, and jump on these. So appreciate our, our panelists doing that. Um, so I, I think we'll just uh, jump right in. So, so Beth, Riley, and Cody have all used Income Lab with uh, a, a variety of clients um, over, over some amount of time. And I think I, I like to start at kind of the high level and just ask, um, maybe Beth, we can start with you since you're, you're on the left on my screen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what in using Income Lab, kind of what you have found most valuable and, and especially maybe what clients have kind of, I don't know, connected with or found valuable as well and maybe how that's changed things. Sure. And stop me when I go on too long because <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a yeah. huge, <laughs> exactly. I need the gong, you know, <laughs> because I am such a huge fan of Income Lab and the way it allows me to speak with my clients and respond to their biggest concern, which is, have I done enough? And for widows, am I going to be okay? And, you know, I can feel confident showing them, you know, walking through an income lab spending plan. Hey, look, with the resources that you have, you know, you know tested against all these historical time periods, this is the amount of money you could be spending. And it's a dynamic plan. We're going to make adjustments when we need to. We can quantify those. But there is no fail here, you know, because everyone wants to be to have this certainty, which, of course, we can't have. Most of the folks that I work with, you know, have sort of lived with scarcity. They've saved a lot. And they're going to continue to do that in the retirement phase of their lives unless something really compelling shows them that they don't need to. And, you know, it was sad for me before there was Income Lab to see my clients continuing to not use their resources in retirement because they were scared that they might have, they might not have enough, you know. And Income Lab is a life changer because my clients can understand it. And they're like, oh, this is, you know, this is where this came from. Wow, this is compelling that I do have enough. And now I can make the choice if I want to, to live differently than I did during all those years of accumulation and not to just spend the minimum. You know, people come to me and say, I want to preserve all my principal. Well, 
you know, I work with middle income folks. Preserving your principal in retirement is not a good plan for having a nice, a nice lifestyle, you know, um, or doing what you want with your resources. Um, so it's it's been huge. That's awesome. Riley, um, what about you? Kind of what, what have clients found most valuable? What have you found most valuable? Yeah, so we launched Income Lab to all of our retired or soon to be retired clients at the end of last year. And we had, we introduced it for the first time. And I've stolen a lot of the language I used to talk about it from you, Justin, and the other gentleman's name I'm not coming to my Johnny. mind right now. What's that? Johnny, probably. And the other person. <laughs> um, and yeah, but using language like Beth said, like this is created to make your like this these guardrails essentially make your plan impossible to fail. Like it's not going to fail. We're only going to make like small adjustments over time. I'm only going to make adjustments. Those adjustments are probably going to be small. And probably the most valuable part, maybe two parts would be using the like historical analysis and explaining it in a way that people can understand that the reason we're so confident in your plan not failing is we've tested it against all of these historical scenarios, all of this information we have about the last one or 200 years of stock market and inflation data. And I think that increases like the level of what confident we are. I no longer feel like I'm just kind of pulling assumptions out of the air or based on whatever software said, like we're using, I think really solid evidence against their plan and clients feel that. And they, it's a, it's a little complex to get across, but once you can figure out how to explain it in a simply, in a more simple way or level that a client can understand, then they really hear that. They like that. And then there's the monitoring side of it. So we we definitely take advantage of the fact that Income Lab is you know monitoring their plan and their portfolio balance and month monthly making updates to that. And so we can utilize that in our language and and reach out to people on a monthly or quarterly basis too to let them know like what that what that monitoring looks like. Have they hit a guardrail? Are they far from a guardrail? Are they on track? If you're, if you're between the guardrails, you can just relax, just enjoy your retirement. If you haven't getting close to a guardrail, then you have nothing to worry about. You can do, you can do nothing essentially. And we got it. Which is great news. So you said you stole some, some things from me and Johnny, but what, what, what of those phrases and things do you actually use and which ones like really help clients understand? Yeah, there, so there's a few like training videos. Um, even the, the the other person on your team that does more of the support, I can't remember his name, but um, right the support videos, all of the videos you guys have, they, you guys have nailed like how to explain these things in a few sentences. Um, so for example, like a big piece of our presentation last year was using the historical analysis slide where it shows you like, here's, for those of you that maybe haven't seen it, it shows you like the income a client wants to have. Uh, their desired income and then it also shows what they should have or the, for the proposed income it could be more it could be less and it's based on like what would work in most situations over time and that chart can be really complex to explain like yeah thanks for bringing it up um but we we have a few different ways of talking about it and basically it's like We say, I say something like in order to do, in order to figure out like what your optimal spending amount is, I just call it back testing. We do back testing. We test your, your like unique financial situation against every situation in history so far that we have data on. We, we have this information on the last 200 years. There's been a lot of good situations. There's been a lot of bad ones. There's been wars, pandemics, political crisis. There's also been good times. And we want to see like in, how much could you spend and be okay in almost all of those scenarios. And sometimes I just leave it at that. And sometimes that's too much for people. And I just end up saying, you know what? You're going to see a green line and a black line. And the goal is to like get those lines close together. And the closer those lines together, the better off we're going to be. And for someone that's really unsophisticated, that can be just having that visual really helps them. Nice. Cody, how about you? Um, you know, what, uh, where have your clients found things most valuable maybe again are there a particular kind of terms of a phrase that help them understand um how you're doing income planning with yeah. income you know i i want to echo beth because i'm in the same situation i mean 
where we're at in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of our clients, they are more affluent, but because of how they were raised, typically, you know, their parents were raised by people that were, or they were raised by people that were raised in the twenties and thirties and everything is a scarcity mentality. And so oftentimes they're never going to run out of money ever. Right. But we find that they are not spending money because they are absolutely terrified because all they've done is save money for the entirety of their lives. And so what we found is it's not about how much we can educate them. And we don't need to bring up Bill Bangin's seminal study from the early 90s and do all this other stuff to prove to them that we are the smartest people in the room. Our job is really more behavior modification, right? Mm -hmm. And it's to let them know we actually have a process and a checklist for how to quantify these myriad of decisions that they're going to have to make in the future. And Income Lab is a lot, it allows us to do that because, you know, what they want to know is that we have a plan and we have a formula and so many people don't really know what to do, right? And so the checklist is huge, but it was also that, you know, without getting too granular to them, I explained to them kind of the um, the retirement smile, right, from uh, Blanchette, where, you know, I always make the uh, example that my grandma is 89 years old and she probably has $2,800 in income and somehow she's got a hundred thousand bucks in the bank. She does not spend money. Right. And so kind of the, the Tom Hegna as well, the go, go, slow, go and no go years is what I framed to them to show them that every fidelity calculator you've used has vastly probably overestimated what they're going to have to spend. And they're using that as the formula for spending money in retirement and so what I'm able to do, and, and I really love the way that you guys put the new um, screen on there for spending capacity, right, versus spend, because we frame everything in the terms of, you know, I kind of say, if you have, you know, if you want to spend 25 grand a month and you have 280 grand to your name, probably going to have a bit of a tough time to do that, right? And so it's really looking at how much do we have and what is the sustainable number that I can spend for the rest of my life, but with the highest degree of confidence in doing that. And so that is where this has really been such a game changer is I can show this screen, explain to them the, you know, here's how much you want. Here's how much, you know, the software proposes. And I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but they may only want and can live comfortably off of 7,000 or 6,000 a month you know, the capacity gives them 15,500. And I say, look, are you going to turn around tomorrow and start doubling your spending? No, probably not. But what this allows us to do is have a, you know, a confidence to instill in you to know that, hey, if you have to spend a couple extra thousand bucks a month, you don't have to constantly look over your shoulder every day and fear that you may just blow through your life savings at a clip faster than you ever thought. And so it really, for me, is more the, the behavioral modification that this entails that allows them to just be empowered that's been the biggest deal for us that's awesome i i do think well especially as we you know launch new features like this dashboard we are trying to think really hard about that behavioral side because it is about like well it's two things but it's the experience itself like what do i feel when i'm you know engaging with my advisor and the other is what is it what does it cause me to do um, and really what we want to cause people to do is to have confidence and go live their life. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, spending it capacity. really complex, right? Yeah. If, you, if you wanted to get deep into that, you melt their brain and ultimately they're going to walk away from you not feeling good about what they just saw because they really won't understand it. Yeah. So I wonder um, if you could each kind of share I don't know if it's a, an actual client experience that you've had in the last, I don't know, a year or so, or you go, feel free to, you know, meld several together and uh, anonymize, <laughs> but uh, like what, what would a typical kind of client engagement look like? The ones in which you use Income Lab, I imagine there are some where you don't, um, and, and where would you bring it in and, and how would you use it and present it? Um, maybe we'll start again with you, Beth. Okay. So folks, I am an advice only hourly planner. Um, so I may use this differently than many of you, but my first engagement with a new client um, is a two hour conversation. And for folks who are close to retirement or in retirement, I actually present Income Lab and we talk about this because it responds to their most burning question. Okay. You know, do, do we have enough? And 
uh, I'll tell you that most in most cases, my clients could be spending two or three times what they are currently spending and what they're comfortable spending. Okay, so Income Lab is a huge aha. And there's a broad spectrum, okay, of, of reactions to this. And, you know, in some cases, I would just be encouraging a client to think as they go through their day about where the places are that they rein themselves in just habitually because they have for their entire lives. And might they want to rethink those in light of the fact that they really could be spending more and never have to worry about running out. So truly for some folks, it is, oh, I don't have to shop around for gas anymore. It doesn't matter. I can go to the most expensive station that's closest to me. Or in one case, I got a couple where the husband does not want to pay someone to clean their house. Well, you know what? They could have their house cleaned every day for the rest of their lives. You know, they're finally making progress on something that they have argued about, you know, for years. But, and then on, on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes I get folks who right out of the gate see this and, you know, I'll ask them, okay, so you have these resources you can deploy in the rest of your life. What is it that you think you would like to do? I mean, is it leaving a huge legacy, which is what you're going to do if you continue to spend the way you have? Or are there ways that you'd like to use your money during your lifetime? And I mean, importantly, for the market segment I deal with, these are not folks who are going to be thinking about, oh, I'm going to increase my consumption, you know, dramatically, like I'm going to buy a house in a more expensive area. I'm going to start driving a Lamborghini. That stuff doesn't appeal to them, you know? So yeah, I'm going to stop price shopping for blueberries, but, you know, probably not. I'm going to have caviar every day. But a lot of folks actually see, oh, wow, I can be supporting the causes that I care about. I can be traveling to visit my family as often as I want to. And, you know, I shared with Justin earlier, I had one client who um, she um, doesn't have kids, was planning on leaving money to a variety of charities, one of them being the college where she went to nursing school and where she subsequently taught nursing for a number of years. And when she saw the income lab stuff, and I encouraged her to think about using resources during her lifetime. She chose to start giving money to her nursing school now, and she's actually had them create and she's endowed a program to provide um, professional development for the faculty there, something that really speaks to her heart. She's doing it now during her lifetime. She gets to see the impact that the dollars that she saved, the resources that, that she grew are making in the world. And, you know. I just love this stuff. I think, wow, I get paid to help people do this kind of stuff. It's awesome. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, Riley, how about you? Yeah, we've had, I was just, so we launched, I said we launched this in 2022 and maybe similar to Beth, but not not quite. Like we are financial planners first and we we actually don't do any of the investment management in-house. We outsource that to third-party investment managers. And, but we, when we launched this last year, when our annual reviews can, our annual reviews contain like three main parts. There's a, a section where we're like, we're just talking about goals and their purpose and what they want to get out of retirement section where we talk about their, we have the portfolio manager sit in and talk about what's happening and what's going on in their investments. And then we introduce this third part, the guardrails kind of presentation. And at the end of every meeting, we asked our clients like, what, what, what did you, what was the most valuable part of our meeting today? And like, nine out of 10 said guardrails. It was like, it was like, boom, guardrails, guardrails, guardrails. Like the counts kind of the goal is like, can we outdo the portfolio management? Can we make that the most interesting part of the meeting? <laughs> That's kind of the, kind of the goal. And, and we have clients from all different asset levels. And so we have like some of our more wealthy clients. We had a situation where uh, the husband had, you know, been making most of the income and dealing with all of the household finances, had saved a substantial amount of money, had pensions in place, had a substantial amount of money set aside for kids that he wasn't even planning to spend. And they weren't withdrawing anything. And they'd recently retired and we we're showing them they can spend like 10 or $15,000 a month. That's what the proposed income lab numbers are showing. And they're spending essentially zero from their portfolio every month. And we didn't approach it so abruptly like that right away, but we got them to like, I think we got them to start spending like $5,000 a month 
uh, right now, and we're going to review that. But you could see the tension between like the the husband wanting to con- he's been saving diligently his whole life, and we have mm-hmm. a spouse who has these kind of grand ideas to to travel back to like their hometowns where they grew up and take their kids on some vacations. And there was mm-hmm. some tension there, and this was really able to like bring them together, like give her permission to do what she wanted to do, and let him see that it was possible without ruining their financial situation and you know yeah ruining what he's been working so hard his whole life to create it also works on the other side though we've had clients where Mm -hmm. proposed income is lower than what they're spending they're spending too much and Mm -hmm. this has been a a great tool to get that point across too Hmm. um in that situation so say like the spending capacity comes up and you know maybe it's uh, they're spending i don't know ten thousand, and really it, it says seven or something like that what do you how does it work in that situation? Yeah, it's it can be a little bit delicate because you don't want to tell them they're they send this feeling that things are not that things are terrible and <laughs> you're gonna run out of money and this is it's too late to do anything about it. But you also don't want to not send that message and make them feel more comfortable than they should be and that they're not gonna change anything at the end of the day. So I think you have to approach everyone a little bit unique. But the one thing we do on our team is do a little bit of like good cop, bad cop, I guess. So like I'm I'm the facts guy. I'm presenting income lab. I'm just saying how it is. I'm not sugarcoating it. We have another partner that's in our meetings that, you know, translates what I'm saying into maybe something more digestible. And it, it works really well. And one one thing we I use in income lab um is in the test plan is the um Let's see. The test plan always takes like five, 10 seconds to like circle around. But what what I'll do is I'll we actually take screenshots of the things in Income Lab and put them in our presentation. And there's the one that shows the likelihood of adjustment, I think it is. And it's like in or once in uh if you basically if you continue, let's just let it load, maybe. Maybe yeah, it won't load. I, sometimes Zoom stops it from loading. Oh, okay. I'm going to just look at my picture here. So there's there's a when you go to the test plan, it'll show how many scenarios are like above the plan and how many scenarios are below or worse than the plan and how much better they are and how much worse they are. So I'll run that for what they're doing now and what they should be doing. And mm-hmm. I can give them some contents for context for like, okay, th- this is what you're doing. This would maybe so this would be the ones like what you should be doing. You should be spending less. And we'd like to see like 96% of your scenarios above the plan. But if you keep doing what you're doing, and so you create another scenario and you do the scenario with, you know, they're spending 10 instead of 7,000, it's going to show, you know what, 25% of your scenarios are above the plan, 75% or below. So I'm not telling you things are over for you, but there's just a, a bigger chance that you're going to get a scenario that's below the plan. And then in those little, in the little writing underneath, it tells you how much below that could actually be. So I think that helps really put it into perspective. That's a nice way to to put it. Yeah, that's right. It's like it like shifts it from catastrophe to like more than likely you're going to have to spend less at some point than you are today, right? You're going to have to come in lower. So and yeah, what are you going to do with that? Great, uh, Cody. Um, any kind of uh, you know examples, typical client situations where Income Lab is used. Yeah, I would say uh, we have a practice very much like Riley described. I mean, we are panoramic planners. And a lot of the times what people end up telling me is, you know, one of the huge reasons we worked with you guys is because you also look at the tax planning. You know, just we have a lot of clients that are affluent and they absolutely need to um, do some sort of strategic Roth conversions over time. And so, you know, it's twofold, whereas we, again, do something similar to what Riley just described, um, both with prospects and with clients. So with prospects, we have something I call um, a roadmap, and it's really a draft. And so we go through kind of each sections of the planning that we do. Um, and I have a little narrative written out, and then we kind of put it on the screen and start going through you know, how we quantify those decisions that we make. And a a good example of what ends up happening a lot is, so I had a client who is 61. She works at, or she worked at Microsoft, making a significant amount of money, enjoying what she did. But, you know, there were things that she had left unfinished relationally, and she wanted to step out of that corporate life. 
And what I always tell people is we help you have a permission slip to spend your money because so many people, again, they're just scared to do that. And we were able to take her who was making, you know, three or $400,000 a year, but was in maybe spending eight grand, nine grand a month to, you know, another question I ask is if we show you that you can live the life that you want to live and spend the money you want to spend with a high degree of certainty, are you going to retire yesterday? Or is this something that you're going to continue to work, you're fulfilled, and this is just kind of checking the psychological box? And she said, I will retire yesterday. And so she's now a client. She did retire. And she retired based on, you know, the, the communication that we gave to her and the confidence. This is a very smart woman, right? So it's, she, she checks her work and there are things that we needed to do to make sure that she could step out and do that, but she ultimately did. And she, I mean, she is our biggest cheerleader now, right? And she is so fulfilled. She's so happy. She had parents who were in their late eighties. And one of the things she wanted to do was spend more time with them. And so I think, you know, we can never underestimate the, the power of what we do for them because it really allows them to do things that you know, maybe she would have worked, her goal was to work five or six more years. Well, what happens in six years to parents who are 89 years old? I don't know. Maybe that time is forever lost, right? And so that's a huge part of it. And that's a pretty typical story for the people that we work with. You know, they finally can step out and say, okay, you know, I've got, you know, I've got the confirmation that I can do these things. But in the same way, you know, we do that with both prospects and clients. But another big part of what we do is, that tax center is so good. You know, we had used Income Solver in the past and you know, Income Solver is good, but it is so complex and the way that they kind of illustrate their concepts can be daunting, right? And so what we typically do is we frame the tax conversation the same way that we do risk and income, which is you have a, you know, what you call the capacity and desire. We call it, you know, the willingness and ability. And I have a lot of people that come into my office to say, Cody, you know what? We think taxes are going to go up. We need to, we need to do some Roth conversions. We've heard about them and we need to get going and we want to be aggressive. Perfect. All right. Well, you have the willingness. It sounds like, let's see what your ability to do conversions is. And so oftentimes we're able to show this. And of course, depending on, and there it is, the bracket management, 32%, depending on who they are, we find the sweet spot is 22 to 24%. Oftentimes, 32% will look really good, but of course, there's that willingness and ability, and ultimately, if we do conversions at 32%, they're not really for you because the break-even is so long, right? But if they have a desire to, you know, leave money the most efficiency, and I once heard Van Mueller say, you know, we believe our clients can spend their money better than, you know, the internal revenue service, assisted living facilities, and hospitals, so we would rather have that money go to the family, but oftentimes I find that the 22 and the 24% conversions are the most palatable for clients because it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm aggressive. Perfect. You're going to have to write an $83,000 check this year to the IRS. Well, let's back that up a little bit, <laughs> right? So it's really just communicating. Again, it's not that we're so smart that we can show you 73 different Roth conversion strategies. It's you have expressed the desire to do conversions. You rightfully said, I don't want to do this on my own. I'm terrified I'll make a mistake. And everybody is terrified of the Internal Revenue Service. I don't call them Uncle Sam because they're not our family members. They are the Internal Revenue Service, right? But this is going back to, hey, we have a methodology for quantifying why, the, why you're making the decisions you're making. And we're here to help you look over your shoulder so that you don't make a mistake. And ultimately, once you've sent that check off, you're not just, you know, having anxiety chip away at you every single day because you wondered if you did it the wrong way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those two parts are, are what we use probably the most amount of times. I think uh, that last point is a really important one too. I mean, the difference between these three levels over a 20 or 30 year plan. I mean, I'm not, I'm not throwing a parade about four basis points, you know, I mean, that's a, that's a rounding error. We're not, right. I think, yeah, as advisors, uh, you know, it sounds like you, you feel you have permission and you should, to, you know, it, this is a, there's some art to this, right? Like you said, matching willingness and ability and so on. Well, what you just said there is, is so good too, which is, it's actually our permission slip. 
again, it goes back to when, when I'm communicating to a client that you can step away from your job and start living 100% off of your savings for the first time, probably in your life. Wow. That's a big burden. That's a big responsibility. Maybe I'm the only one who stays up at night, making sure and checking the box, you know, checking boxes in my head to make sure that I, you know, hopefully that software is really accurate because we just had people make really big decisions based on some of the things that we show, right? And so it is a permission slip for us as advisors to know, hey, we're helping you make the right decision based on math and science and not myth, uh, misconception and emotion. Right. No, we believe me, we take that very seriously as well. These are consequential life decisions. I mean, they are. The, the, we're not, you know, I don't know, creating a fun little, uh, game here this is real life it's not an excel sheet <laughs> um so i guess getting i mean you've you you all have already touched on a lot of kind of the, the, the practicalities of um using income lab in your practice um and a few have mentioned kind of uh, you know particular screens that you like but maybe we could um round that out with you know are there and I know a lot of this is new, so maybe you haven't had as much chance to use kind of the new dashboard and the guardrails view, you know, like I'd be curious if you have thoughts on, you know, for those people where maybe they're, they're, they're spending very low, you know, is this useful uh, or they're spending very high, is this useful? Are there other places maybe in, that have been around in the app for a while that you have just that you find yourself using in every single meeting with a retiree? Um Maybe we'll we'll reverse uh, here since uh, Beth, you've had to go first every time. <laughs> <laughs> so Cody, uh, what 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 screens do you use the most? Um, you know the ones that you're showing. So we used on the older. If you go to the older, the classic view. What I would always start out with um, when we're looking at how much income to spend, I'd start like on our narrative on our roadmap draft. We talk about here's what you desire. Here's the total of your pension and, and social security, right? And then here's that gap, mm -hmm. if there is a gap. And so what we tell people is most, you know, conventional wisdom kind of dictates in the advisor world that you would take money out from taxable, tax deferred and tax free. And sometimes that can be absolutely accurate, but sometimes it's not. And so we want to make sure we're making that right decision. But going back to what Beth has talked about and what Riley also said, and I think we all have this issue is, they're so scared of spending money because they've never, you know, they've, they've lived for the last 30 years with their employer dictating everything that they do, you know, the healthcare, the taxes, the income, and now, hey, it's your turn to be your own income planner. Well, they want to make sure they're doing it the right way. They have no knowledge of doing it. So I like to kind of isolate that box, the income goals in the bottom right first and say, okay, here's what you said that you wanted to spend. Right now, the essential is if you just have to live on top ramen for a few years, you know, this is like your minimum baseline income if things fall apart, right? Now, we hope that we never get to that that area, but, you know, this is what we describe as your basic living expenses. Here's your desired. Now, based on your, you know, your income or your assets, some inflation, conservative rates of return, you know, all of the myriad of economic factors that could happen over decades and decades, here's what our software says or proposes that you can spend. And I wrap that in the framework of capacity, right? And, you know, ability, desire and capacity. And they say, wow. And oftentimes the, the gap is so big, right? And so I'll say, now, does this mean you're going to, you know, start tomorrow spending 12000 a month? No, but it goes back to having that confidence. And then I'll kind of move up and say, but let me give you an example. Or we have found a lot of times that people don't really know when they can take more money off the top or when maybe they have to take a step back. And so that's when I would explain those guardrails, right? To say, this software, we're monitoring this real time. It is integrated with Charles Schwab. So we're going to know if we ever surpass that guardrail. Now, does again, does that mean if the market goes up 5% that we're automatically just going to start spending $789 more? Not necessarily. And on the other side, does it mean we're going to have to decrease our income? Not necessarily. It goes back to having a method for quantifying the decisions that we make, right? Because they don't. They have no process. And if we stepped into their job for one day, we'd have no idea what we were doing either, right? 
So just communicating to them that we have this systematic way to know that, hey, during 2020, when the market fell apart, oh my God, should we just cut back? And, you know, human nature has shown that we're not just going to let our assets run out to zero because that's not how we operate. We're going to cut back. We're going to stop a bunch of subscriptions and we're just going to live, you know, at, at our minimum essential level. But I love this because it allows us to tell people, hey, the market's down 12%. You that doesn't mean you have to go full, you know, top ramen mode, right? Well, how do you know that? Well, because we are monitoring this and tracking it using math and science. So, I mean, all of these squares, I, I generally would explain in pretty significant detail, right? And I mean, when I say detail, conceptually, so that they can understand how it works and why it actually applies to their life. So, I mean, I mean, I've had many meetings, guys, where I just use this screen alone. And like Riley said, it's so funny how we as advisors, in our mind, we think this is the most important. But in the client's mind, it's far from it, right? It's ultimately, golly, how can how much money can I spend? And I just don't want to run out of money. I don't want to be in my elderly years with less than I ever thought possible. And this helps them, you know, tremendously with that. That's great. That's great. Riley, is it similar for you? Do you use this this screen primarily? I know you also said the historical analysis is something that you 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 hit. Are there other ones? Yeah, I think what was important for us when we launched this was we so we launched like in the quarter four of last year, but in the summer we asked a few clients to beta test it with us. There's a lot of screens to choose from here. Like you got the four tabs, and the test plan has like four tabs inside of it. And then you got yeah. the new uh, stress testing tab. And there's a lot of cool stuff you can show. And it took us a while to figure like, what do we show? What do we not show? We want to show everything. It's all really cool. Um, but for us, it start first thing that starts with outside of Income Lab is what we did was just calculate what someone's spending right now. We don't ask them to make a budget or anything yet. We're just like, we know what their employment income is. We know what they're withdrawing. We know like their pension, social security. So we can pretty much calculate what they're spending if they're we know if they're saving any of that so we can get an idea of what they're spending. Then we'll go over that with them. Like, so we're on the same page. We know what you're spending. Do you know what you're spending? Do we all agree what you're spending? Right. We'll make sure that's clear. Then I'll present just a generic spending smile, just like the shape basically, and go over like, this is what you're spending now. This is what we think your spending is going to do over time. We think it's going to take this kind of curve. And this is why, and doesn't mean you're going to take that curve, but I'll see if they want to debate me on that. You know, do they, do they think their curve is going to look different for any reason or another? If they don't have any good reason for why it should be different, then we'll say, okay, let's go with this for now. Then once we kind of uh, all on the same page of that, we'll compare like, okay, we know what you're spending now. We know what the curve is now. What is, what is the, what, is, what do we think you should spend based on historical analysis? That would be the historical. Maybe the, this would be the first time we bring up Income Lab would be the historical analysis page showing their proposed income and their desired income and looking at how far, how big of a difference are there between these lines and explain how we calculated that. Then it kind of moves into, that's going to be like the first part. And then the next part would be talking about the guardrails. And... I kind of separate these two and say, we, not, we now know like what you should be spending or what you want, you should be spending more or less. Now let's figure it, tell you like when we think you should change that. And for that, we have this, these guardrails in place. And the way that I'll, the way that I've explained that is that I play this little game with clients. It, you know, we've played this game like 50 to a hundred times now. And uh, essentially it, I could bring it up, but it's really easy to explain. Essentially you've all probably seen it. It's where, you have two scenarios of someone with like a million dollars withdrawing a certain amount of each month. And then you have the sequence of returns reversed in each scenario. And essentially in each scenario has an average 7% return or whatever you want to use. But in the scenario where the returns, you know, are one way and the other way, one money in one scenario, you run out of money like 15 years into retirement. And the other one, you end up at age 100 with like a million dollars left still. <laughs> And it's crazy that just the sequence of returns can change that. And so we tell people, look, you're going to get a certain sequence of returns in retirement. You might get the one that, you know, depletes your money really fast. You might get the one that leaves you with more money if you started 
if you don't make any changes along the way. The hard part is knowing when to make changes. And that's what the guardrails are going to do. Like they're going to stop either of those situations from happening. They're both bad. We don't want you to, it sounds great to have more money than you started with, but it's actually not because you probably could have done a lot of things in your life. You probably could have given money to the people you wanted to, done things with your family, gone on the trips you wanted to. Of course, it's bad to run out of money. We're going to make sure that doesn't happen. But from our perspective, both are bad. And we're going to, and the guardrails is going to help us avoid both. That's great. I like that a lot. We don't use the the main page. We never use the, it's real. what's really funny is we have a presentation that essentially in Google slides that animates the same way you have this. It's like you copied our presentation. So now I have these a hundred slide decks that uh, essentially now you just have it in the software now. So that's great. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Beth, let me, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up uh with you before we take some questions looks like we do have a bunch um are there particular you know screens visuals that that you find yourself using over so, so what i'm doing is i'm meeting with my clients virtually so i'm sharing my screen with income lab up in real time and before i show them anything i talk to them about why i believe in income lab so they understand and riley i love the way you know that this is not a projection we've historically back tested the assets that you actually have okay um and also just so you know you know i have clients who sometimes are like yeah but you know everything's not going to keep growing blah 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 and you know i'll suggest to them that if they actually believe there's going to continue to be a world with a bunch of humans on it and that we're all going to need to be fed and clothed and we're probably going to want whatever the newest toy is and da da da, that over time, things are probably going to continue to grow. It's just it's not going to be straight line. That makes sense to most people. They don't really think that all the humans are going to go away and the world's going to go to hell in a handbasket. So I actually walk them through in the old, you know, in the old view. I haven't, I haven't started using the new view. I walk them through the screens and this first screen we spend a bit of time on. I quickly show them the cash flow screen and talk about the spending smile. And that makes sense to most people. They, they get that. By the time I get to historical analysis and I just show it pretty quickly they like seeing where the line is, and they already have understood in the big picture what the back testing means and why they care about this. And then the test plan, and particularly where we quantify, you know, this is the likelihood of the kind of changes you're going to have to make. This is a screen that gives people loads of comfort. I use this with the scenarios above and below plan. I take a kind of a different approach to this. I'm not trying to get my people with where all their scenarios are above plan. To me, that is way too conservative. I want folks to spend more than that. And people get comfortable with having lower percents of scenarios above plan when they see the next screen, which is here are the kinds of adjustments we're talking about. You know, you're talking about downside adjustments. We're not talking about living under the overpass. You know, we're talking about maybe you're not going to get a cost of living adjustment. It, you know, um, this really gives people a lot of comfort. Um, don't do, I don't do a lot of detail. I don't do more detail than, you know, than this with folks, at least at the outset. That's great. Um, well, thank you all. That was. That was just awesome. Some 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 similarities, similar experiences, some differences. Perfect. Um, Taylor, I don't know if you've been uh, scouring our Q and A for the. I have questions, but I think we could yeah. uh, maybe start taking some of this. Yeah. So just a reminder, everyone, if you have a, there are some. Uh, we have like thirteen questions. So if there's questions you want to have answered, um, please like them or upvote them so we can get to the most popular ones because I'm not sure we'll have enough time for all of these, but to start us off, um, does so let's go to this one right here. Any best practices for explaining lifetime experience? Am I correct that this experience is the average of wealth you would be able to take over the lifetime of the plan? I can take the technical question. Uh, that That is essentially right. So this is what it's doing is saying, all right, here's your 
it's comparing the overall income experience and it's actually in the background we uh where we mortality adjust it so that we we care more about the income early than the income when you're 100 um and we could just compare that to the plan you set off on which is this and we just say was it better or worse and and so that's that's what you're seeing here so now, okay do you have any ways to talk about that that um, next question is for Cody. For Cody, uh, curious if your checklist is something you could share. Yeah, I'm, I'll share everything I have with anybody. I'm okay with that. Uh, next question is for Riley. Do you have any suggestions or things you would do different when introducing it to your existing clients? We're getting ready to roll out and any feedback would be helpful. I would recommend like the the kind of the beta testing we did. like. I'll pick a pick a few clients um, that you want to just we just told them like look we're, we're planning on rolling out this new retirement planning tool and the later in the year we want to get some practice discussing it and presenting it and get your feedback on what parts you liked because everyone's circumstance probably be a, di be a bit different you know what you showed your clients before this is probably different than ours and so and you get you get some practice explaining the different pages and concepts and seeing which ones resonate with clients. And I just put special attention to like what, what types of clients you're sharing to. For us, our presentations were very different when it came to people far from retirement, people really close or just retired, and people that were kind of well into retirement. There are essentially like three different ways to have diff different screens got used, different words got used to explain it. And so maybe think about like which one of those groups most of your clients in and maybe hone in on those ones first. Okay. What are the pros and this, we'll go to Beth since the other two have answered. Okay. And maybe, I don't know if y'all want to answer as well. What are the pros and cons of sharing the income lab link directly with the client? You know, I, I don't think there's a downside with sharing the link. I have a number of clients who didn't feel like they wanted to go in there and do anything. And, um, and when I do share the link with clients, you know, all I ask is that they not go too crazy. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of the guys is an engineer, um, you know, not, not disparaging engineers, but I've got another guy I shared a link with recently who's who's really far from retirement. And I just use this to do like a downside scenario for him. And I told him, I don't want you to get really focused on this. Just keep doing what you're doing. We'll talk about this when you're closer <laughs> to retirement. But, you know, I, I feel free to, to share the link. And actually, I'm hopeful that it'll help me learn more about Income Lab because my clients will go in there and be looking at stuff that I'm not usually looking at and come back with questions. Right. Riley, I, I've done it for, a, you know, with, here at Pacific Northwest, we have a lot of Boeing clients, like a lot of software engineers, Amazon. I mean, just some of the most intelligent people at what they do that you can find. And I once gave one of them a, a Wade Fowl book. And this guy is extremely bright. And he thought he wanted it. And he was like, yeah, that was even deep for me. And I'm like, all right, never doing that again. Mm -hmm. And I've sent this like one or two times to people. And what I've found, just like all of the things that we do is everything is in the framing of how we position it and in the context. And so if I've already kind of gone through all of the context to it, maybe I'll send it. But ultimately, I want them to get their talking points from me. Right. And when they go through this without me there, that's kind of they're left to their own devices. So I don't do it much. Riley? Yeah, I've never I just put fake emails in there. I, I heard we that's don't right. have to put emails anymore. <laughs> so that's nice. And uh I've never shared the link with anyone. Part of it's because we're I'm in Canada too, if people didn't notice. And so there's a lot of things in the software that we just have to kind of customize to make it work here for Can Canadians. Mm -hmm. Um, there's another question. How do you address legacy money left over in the tax center versus legacy page? Many times the numbers are different. Yeah. Has that ever come up? I don't even know if you're, you're aware of it. So on the plan test or in, uh, the, uh, retirement stress test. So here you can kind of see, okay, way at the end of the plan, 30, 30 plus years in, all right, we got this range of possible, 
balances in today's dollars. Uh, it's similar if you go to the stress test, except now you're just looking at one exact scenario. Let me uh, do a high income one and find one that's longer. So you'll see, you know, uh, here's the ending balance. In this case, they've started out between two and 3 million and they're at about a million. And I think what they're saying is, but if you use Life Hub, mm -hmm. it's it's more of a straight line thing. Have you run into that as an issue? You know, here I'm at eight million. <laughs> I try not even just personally. You know, the only time I'm really getting deep into, you know, everything is in the framework of not melting their brain. I want them to walk away having taken what what I want them to take from that conversation. And so oftentimes I'm not, I mean, most of the time I'm not even getting deep into legacy. The only time we really discuss it is on the tax center page where it has like the four boxes where it shows the, the decrease in marginal rate, the amount of taxes they save, like this one right here. And so it's kind of saying, hey, conventional wisdom would tell you that if you do it this way, here's the, the results, right? And then using a 22 or 24% bracket management, it's going to, you know, increase or decrease the legacy, et cetera. Um, but I have found that there's like two or three different answers sometimes. So that's why I'm not going too deep into the legacy because <clears throat> the last thing I want is for them to get focused on why is the legacy $432,000 different over here? Because I don't have Justin next to me to answer that. <laughs> Yeah, I would never go into that level of detail with my clients and even the clients who have access don't do that. And you know what, if they came back and asked me, why is this different? You know what, I would shoot off an email to Ben and say, you know, explain to my client the technical reasons why this is different. And I'd say, and so what? This is a projection. You're looking how, you know, there are a few ways to do it. Not what we need to focus on. And I also tell them that the minute you walk out of the door, this is all going to change because your life's going to change. And anybody that had a plan in 2019, there was a hole blown through it by 2020, right? And so it's never going to work out exactly like this. This is for us to start having a framework of what it could look like. Yeah. And I would say legacies, because they are by definition, the farthest in the future point and in the plan, they are the least likely projection to be correct, right? I think about it as like, you got a big stick in your hand. If it's really long and I move it even just a tiny bit, whoa, that top moved, <laughs> right? Really far. So I think that's what's going on. And, and probably the biggest thing to know about the tax center and the uh, life hub, if you ever do get that question, is what you're viewing here is a plan that does not adjust. Now, in reality, we're going to adjust. The reason you don't see adjustments here is I don't want to put an adjustment in 2026. And now you think that really is going to happen for sure, right? There are going to be adjustments, but those adjustments are, they're, they're, they're not predictable when they'll happen or exactly what they'll be, but we're set up for them. So that's really, it. you wouldn't have such a big legacy if you actually took the upward adjustments or found ways to, you know, help your favorite charities, things like that. Um, speaking of the legacy aspect, I'm going to combine two questions here since we probably only have time for this one. So this is, can we... Can we have a brief run through of exactly how you show this to a client since if this is their first time seeing Income Lab? And with that, um, curious about the process that leads to actual changes in client behavior. So it's they're asking, like, you know, we don't want clients to have to worry about their balance day in and day out. And when you show them what uh, my experience has been that the clients maintaining maintain their expending, even though their capacity is higher. So. How often do you have them look at it and when, how do you change their behavior? What do you have them look at um, to show them and, and have, see if they'll take more? It's a lot. Go for it. I'm going to take the, I think the, the behavior change in particular um, is an interesting one. Any stories about someone who's actually changed their behavior or do you just make the plan more conservative to try to match the fact that they... Don't I want to hear Beth's answer on that. And what do you show them? What are you showing <laughs> them? To, to, to try Cody, to change behavior? You're going to be shocked, but I actually cannot change my client's behavior. <laughs> hard as I try. You know what? All I'm trying to do is plant the seed and I will remind people over the time. 
over time. And some of them are open to thinking about changes and they'll take some of my suggestions to examine the way they're doing things. And some of them aren't. And I don't adjust their plans. I just show them over time. Yep, look, you're only spending a third of what you could be. So, you know, I, as, as one client said to her husband, oh, so we're going to leave all this money we worked really hard for to people who care about it less than we do. <laughs> um, you know, I think you, I think you make a really good point. And yeah, like everybody here that's listening to this webinar, you know, oftentimes, you know, you, you listen to the lottery winners who run out of money in four years. It's usually because of their, their image sees themselves as not knowing what to do with money. Everybody on this webinar, if you got an extra 500,000 or 100,000 or $50,000, you're probably not going to go tomorrow and increase your monthly spend by 50 or a hundred percent because you live ingrained in your habits, right? So what I've found with clients is it's not so much that they're going to immediately start spending 6,000 more a month. It is this, this understanding and this certainty that in six months, they were thinking about going on this trip on a cruise to the Mediterranean. And they didn't quite know if they could do that or if it was sustainable in terms of their income. They see these things and they say, oh man, maybe we can do this. And usually it's the wife turning to the husband saying, trip. We're going on that trip now, right? <laughs> and so it's really, it goes back to, we have the formula and a methodology for quantifying why they need to do what they need to do or if they can do that. And so usually in my experience, it's someone calling me and saying, hey, Cody, we're thinking about, I just had someone say, we want to go on a trip to Israel. It's with our church. It's going to cost $25,000. I think we're okay doing that, but you know, how does that affect or impact the long-term plan and can we do it? Right. And so it's again, we're giving them the permission slip to do some of these things. And, you know, there's it's invaluable to them. So that's how we look at it, not necessarily the monthly habit change. I wonder a couple of things come to mind. One is, and I know we have not had this for a long time, but I wonder if this will be useful to you as well. This slider has uh, the bookends on kind of now they're just defaults. You can do other things, but this is you could think of it as all right, this is a pretty darn conservative plan. Now, if they're still spending a lot less than this, then, I mean, in a way, it's like, well, good for you. You're living well within your means. But you can see, you know, there's a, there's a range here. It's 1800 bucks a month, which annualized, that's, you know, that's a decent difference in, in annual spending. Um, so I wonder if this will be useful to you. Um, and I like that. So it, for, it sounds like a lot of you have this experience where people are actually living, I mean, almost too well within their means, right? So you'll probably end up pegging it to the left because what that does is it just moves the lower guardrail down even farther. It's going to take a lot longer, if ever, for them to get bad news, which is probably feels good for them, right? Um, and then what I've heard you all say, which I liked a lot, is making it really specific on, okay, maybe they do have excess capacity. What are you going to do with it? Actually, even the don't shop for gas, don't shop around for gas is a good one. I like that. I like but that. But the, okay, is there a trip? Is there a, you know, I mean, I got a six-year-old, a three-year-old, a two-year-old. Like I, if you told me I got an extra 10,000 bucks this year, I know exactly what I would do. Like there, right. so as opposed to just, I don't know, buy nicer wine or something, that, that's probably not as-, as uh, That's inspiring. fun too though. <laughs> but you know, it's it really is exactly as Cody said, like I've had folks, you know, who are like sweating buying a car. It's like, just buy the car. I've had folks who said, can we really buy this RV? Yes, you can really buy the RV and show them. See, it doesn't make a difference. And I've also had folks who've been willing to start putting a couple thousand dollars a month more in their checking account because they know that's what it'll take for them to actually stop shopping for gas. You know, combination. It's all behavior, right? Well, we are at the top of the hour. So again, wanted to thank you all for being our panelists. Uh, this is, you know, again, as Justin said, one of our most popular webinars. So we are very thankful for you all for spending your time and sharing with us how you use Income Lab. Justin, right. anything else? So much, Beth, Riley, Cody, really appreciate it. I learned it. a lot from both of you. <clears throat> so thank you very much. It was very helpful for me. This this was a great conversation. I really appreciated hearing how Cody, you and Riley present this. It's useful stuff. Lots to yeah. share. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you. you. See you next time. Thanks, Justin. Thanks, Taylor.